do is, is I've done a little PowerPoint, and I'm just basically going to talk to you all about the slides on the PowerPoint. But when we get done, if you all have questions and stuff, we'll do question and answer when we get done. So if everybody's in good shape, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the PowerPoint, and we'll start with that. And it won't take too long. I'll just do some general talking. Oh, let me back up real quick. Okay, so for Fish and Wildlife in Kentucky, we try to do the slogan, we want you to boat safe on the water. And when we say boat safe on the water, it's basically safe is an acronym. It stands for safety, awareness, functional, and educated. Um, I will throw out this little PowerPoint presentation, we're going to kind of answer what's safety, what's awareness, what's functional, and what's educated. So, but I just want to kind of get that in your all's mind right now that we want you to boat safe on the water in Kentucky, in Virginia, or wherever you are. So, there's basically four classes of boat, um, and it's all set up on boat length. So, you see the first class is called Class A and it's less than 16 feet in length. Then they go on to class one, two, and three. And like I said, it's all by the length of the boats. So 16 to 26 is class one, 26 to 40 is class two, and anything larger than 40 feet is considered class three. But those are the four basic um, classes. And what you're gonna find out is, is boating in Kentucky or boating in Virginia or boating in other states, most of this stuff is standardized across all the states. Um, so what's class one, two, and three here is also class one, two, and three in other states. So that uh, will be helpful to you. But anyway, four classes. And I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, we're going to talk about tongue weight. And not only when you have a boat, you also have a boat trailer. So your boat has a certain amount of a weight to it, and then you've got to add the gas to it, and then you've got to add all the things that you're going to take onto the water with you on it. So you want your boat trailer to definitely be rated to handle that weight uh, for the boat and everything that's in it. And then not only do you want the uh, trailer to be able to handle the weight of the boat, but also your receiver hitch on your vehicle, which you attach your boat trailer to, it has a rating and that needs to be rated to handle the weight. And an important thing with a trailer is called tongue weight. And tongue weight, let me get this out of the way. Tongue weight is the weight that your boat and trailer exerts on your tow hitch right here on the ball hitch. You want that weight to be no more than 10% of the total of your boat and everything on it. So if your boat and trailer weigh a thousand pounds, you don't want your tongue weight to be any more than a hundred pounds. Anything more than that is considered to be unsafe. Now, a lot of times I'll have people ask me, they'll say, well, how do you know, how do you determine what's tongue weight? Well, if any of you all have ever gone to YouTube, you can actually just go to YouTube and click tongue weight. How do I get my tongue weight for my trailer? And it shows you the process and it's pretty simple. I mean, they use two basic bathroom scales and some blocks to get your tongue weight. So if you don't know what your trailer's tongue weight is, there's a way to go on and find it out, and that is through YouTube. But the main thing to know is, is you don't want to overload your trailer uh, for its capacity, because if you start doing any of that or your, or your receiver hitches over capacity, you're gonna create problems with safety. So just wanted to start off to talk about the trailer and tongue weight because that's actually an important thing. And then I have these arrows that highlighted here. For you all that do boat, does any of you all know why we cross our safety chains? These are called safety chains. They attach from your trailer to your vehicle. The, actually, the reason that we crisscross them is that if this, for some reason, this latch lets go and your trailer comes off that ball hitch, Instead of it falling and hitting the highway, your safety chains are actually going to catch your trailer right here 
and keep it from falling to the ground. So that's an important thing to always do is crisscross your safety chains. And the other arrow I had lined out here was basically what I was telling you about, make sure that your towing package on your vehicle is rated to pull whatever weight your boat and trailer is. All those need to work in conjunction to make it safe for you to go down the highway before you even get on the water. The next most important thing that we can talk about for safety equipment with boating is life jackets. Um, some you will hear them called PFDs. That PFD basically stands for a personal flotation device. Um, there's five different types of life jackets. And I, I kind of consider, I tell people that my life jacket is like my seatbelt in a boat. Um, and I've been trying to get people um, to think of it that way because some of us remember that how when we used to not have to wear seatbelts when we started, we had a hard time with it. Well, now it's like a habit. The first thing you do when you get in your car is click your seatbelt. Well, I want everybody to get in the habit of when they get on a boat and the boat is moving, whatever, when it's moving, you need to have your life jacket on uh, because your life jacket's not going to do you any good if you're not wearing it. Now, when the boat stops, fine, take it off, keep it close to you, but I want I want everybody to start a habit of wearing a life jacket when the boat's moving. But basically there's five different types. And I'll just kind of briefly describe them to you. Type one is a specialty vest. And this picture down here is a, another picture of a specialty vest. The great thing about type one vests are almost without doubt, 100% of the time, they will flip you back over uh, if you're face down in the water. So that's very important because if you have a boat accident, since there's not a seatbelt in the boat, the boat's gonna stop moving and guess what? You're not. So you may be thrown into something or thrown out of the boat. Well, if you become incapacitated or knocked out and hit the water face down and it doesn't flip you back over, you've had a bad day. So that is the wonderful thing about type ones. They will turn you back over even if you're unconscious. So that is actually our safest life jacket. Um, the little orange dinghies, what I call them, they're type twos. Uh, they're the ones that's most common that people see most of the time. They are super cheap, but they're super effective. Uh, for one, they fit a wide variety of people. And for number two, not every time, but sometimes they will flip an unconscious victim over too because of that back part around the neck. They'll turn you back over. Now, type three, type three is a, this is a picture of type three down here. It's usually the vest you see when people are skiing, tubing, riding a jet ski, that kind of thing. As you notice, it doesn't have a back piece on the back of the head. So we know that that vest isn't gonna flip us back over if we happen to be unconscious. But type three is something we see a lot with uh, water sports. Now, type four is actually a PFD because uh, it's a personal flotation device, but it does not qualify for a life jacket. And I'm gonna go over the legal requirements here in just a second. But a type four is a PFD, but like I said, it is not a life jacket. And in a boat, remember when we went over the different classes, Anything that is above class A, which is less than 16 feet, has to at least have one throw cushion on board to be legal. So anything 16 foot and a larger has to have a throw cushion. Type five is one of the newer vests. They've been out for a while, but you all have seen them. There are auto inflatables. Uh, you can either manually inflate them or some of them like we wear for work. If you go in the water and they're underwater for so long, they'll auto inflate. The nice thing about the top five life jacket is, is it's less bulky. So people enjoy wearing it because it doesn't bother them as much. But with the top five, it can't be worn for certain things. Like a person under 16 years of age, they cannot wear a top five yet. The, you have to be 16 years and older. And if you're water skiing, jet skiing, or doing that does not qualify for you. Because in an accident, you may get incapacitated, like I said, and this thing takes uh, some time to be activated. 
So if you're wearing your type three, it automatically is gonna make you float. But main thing to know here is, is hey, there's several different types of life jackets. If you want it to be super safe, type one is the best because like I said, it's gonna flip you back over. But type two is excellent and type three is excellent as well. Those are the two you see the most is type two and three and now top five. So what makes a life jacket legal by law? Well, there's four criteria that a life jacket has to meet to be legal. The very first and foremost one is, if you can read this, it has to be US Coast Guard approved. And this is the inside of a life jacket. Any life jacket that you buy will have all this information printed on it somewhere. The auto inflatables, uh, my dad has one that he wears around his waist. It's printed on the outside of the package. But you're gonna find this no matter where you're at and pick it up, it's gonna have information on it. And one thing you're looking for is this US Coast Guard approved. If you do not see US Coast Guard approved, it's not gonna count. Um, it may float you and it may be something you can use, but by law, like if you're on the water, and a conservation officer checks you, we're gonna to look to see that it's Coast Guard approved. <coughs> Excuse me. The second biggest thing is, is it's gotta fit you, which means it's gotta be the proper size. And you can see here on this one, it says child, and then it says weight 30 to 50 pounds. Now, if you're an adult and you hold this life jacket up to me, and I look at it and I can tell it's for a child, and then I flip it over and read it for a child, that's not gonna do you any good. So Coast Guard approved has to fit you uh, and be the proper size. And to see up here, it tells you type three. They all most all the time tell you what type of vest it is. So those are two categories to be legal. The third one is it's gotta be functioning. And when we say functioning, that means if it's got buckles, the buckles have to be in good working order. If it's got a zipper, the zipper's gotta be in good working order. We come up there and the zipper's broke or the buckle's broke or the foam is torn and hanging out of the life jacket, that doesn't count because if it doesn't work, if it can't buckle or can't zip, it's not gonna work. You're gonna go in the water and it's coming off. So therefore it's not a legal life jacket. That's our third criteria. The last criteria is it's gotta be readily accessible. And that's why I put this picture on here. This is pretty common now. You can buy a bunch of these orange dinghies that I'm talking about. They come in a four pack and they're in this package, which is great. I mean, that fits right under your pontoon boat seat. But guess what? When we say readily accessible, do you think in an emergency, you can get to that within 10 seconds? And the answer to that is no. Um, so that's not gonna work. And I know if most of y'all have been on a boat, when you start looking for a life jacket, where are the life jackets usually at? They're usually like the farthest place, crushed up under something that it can be. And there's no way to get to that easy, quick, and in a hurry. So readily accessible means it needs to be where you can get your hands on it quick. So those are the four criteria that makes a life jacket legal. Um, Coast Guard approved, fits the person it's made for, uh, readily accessible and functioning. But go, next time you're in Walmart or something, you pick up a life jacket, look at them. You'll see that information on all of them. So, but that's what's gonna make a life jacket legal. And life jackets are probably the most important safety equipment that you can have with you, even if you're not on a boat. Um, I tell people when I teach classes, we have a lot of training in swimming, but if I go to the lake and I get in the lake or I get in the river, I always have my life jacket on because if something strange happens, like I get a cramp or you get hung on a log or the water gets rough all of a sudden and I get start struggling, I don't have to be as afraid because I know that my life jacket's, what I say, has got my back. So always, always take your life jacket uh, with you wherever you go and get in the habit of when that boat's moving, you have it on. Now, another law that's in Kentucky and Virginia is probably gonna be right there with us, uh, most of all the states around us are, is if you're boating and you have a child under the age of 12 years old, 
they have to have a life jacket on when the boat's moving. Like I was telling you all, once you get in the habit of wearing it, well, these children, by law, they have to have it on. Um, it's for their safety. And you notice all these, most of these children's life jackets have the little part on the back, which is what helps keep their head up out of the water, kind of like a type one life jacket. But that's something that uh, a lot of people don't know is that if you've got children, grandchildren, if they're under 12, they've got to have that on when it's moving. Now, when the boat's stopped and not moving, they can take it off. That's perfectly fine. So that ends up life jackets. Next thing I want to talk about is, and this little section right here I'm going through is kind of the legal requirements, what legally you have to have for your boat and for you to make everything uh, be proper. But you're going to, it's called a capacity plate. Every boat made now, new for many, many years, has a capacity plate out put on it. And a capacity plate tells you a few very important facts. Like it shows you how many people can be on the boat, and out of that, what the maximum weight is. And then it also shows you the nut horsepower, the max horsepower that you can have on that boat. Like if you had a if this was your pontoon boat and you put a 175 horsepower motor on it, it may work, but by law, you're in violation. And then I tell people like this, if you're in a boat accident, there's almost guaranteed if somebody got injured, that there's gonna be a lawsuit. And even if you were in the right, if you had the wrong size motor on your boat, they're gonna make you be liable for that. So it's very important never to go over the max horsepower that your capacity plate says. And then it all, like I said, it tells you how many people can be on the boat and what the maximum weight is for all that stuff. See, this one's 1,400 pounds with people in motors and gear. So you need to, when you get a boat or you have a boat, pay attention to your capacity plate and uh, make sure you're following the rules and regulations on that. Now, this is registration. Virginia's registration may look a little bit different, but it's gonna have the same gist. This is just like when you go register your vehicle. You're gonna register your boat every year. It's always the first, of, it's gotta be done by the 1st of May. Um, there's all kinds of information on here. Uh, tells you your name, address, all that stuff. The important thing that it shows you is this right here. This, <laughs> along with this certificate, you have to put these numbers on your vessel. And it has to be on the front forward part of the boat on the right and left side with the registration decal. But that's the important thing to know. Some people have a hard time knowing what numbers they gotta put on there. Sometimes they'll try to put these numbers on there. But actually your KY numbers will be right here. And it's always gonna say KY for Kentucky be four numbers <clears throat> and then two more letters. Virginia is more than likely is gonna say VA and then be the same kind of thing. But this certificate right here, it needs to be on the vessel as well. Uh, when we do a compliance check, we'll say, I need to see your registration. Well, you present that paper to us just like you would if you were pulled over on the highway, they're gonna ask you for it. So that's, that has to be on the boat. And I use this picture of a jet ski just to show you what the sticker is going to look like. Uh, the numbers and the letters need to be a minimum of three inches high, and they need to be spaced like this. Uh, they don't need to be running together. And then the registration decal is always going to be six inches behind your lettering and numbering. The other thing to remember on this is, is if your boat, whatever color the hull is, black, purple, blue, white, your registration numbers and stuff need to be a contrasting color <clears throat> so that we can see, visibly see them from a distance. Uh, they don't need to blend in with the color of your boat. Okay, so life jackets, you have to have one for everybody in the boat. And then we went over what makes them legal. Two, you had to have your registration certificate and your stickers on your vessel. Now, a third legal requirement is, is if you're running a gas motor, you know, if you're paddling <coughs> by oars, you don't have to, but if you've got a motor and on paddles, or if you've got anything that has 
a petroleum product on board your vessel must have a fire extinguisher. Must have a fire extinguisher and it has to be type B. Uh, there's different classes, A, B, and C, but must have a type B for marine use. And, and it's something that's also, if you remember my word safe and functional, you need to make sure that your fire extinguisher is functional. Once you get one, it doesn't mean it's good for life. Uh, most of them will have a, a, a dial on here and if it's in the green, you're still good. If it's not in the green, it's not good anymore and you either need to go get a refill or buy a new one. Some of them will have a plunger on them. It's like an ink pen. If you push down on the plunger and it pops back up, then you're still charged. But if you push on that plunger and it stays down, that means you need to go get another fire extinguisher. The fire extinguishers are petroleum products must have. So if you're in a canoe and you're paddling, but yet you've got a lantern in there with some Coleman fuel, or you've got like a little grill with a propane tank, you still need to have a fire extinguisher. So that's something to also be aware of. Another thing that makes a boat legal is if you're gonna be out after sunset, you have to have navigation lights. Um, sunset does not mean dark. Sunset, if you watch the news or you look on your uh, smartphone at the weather app or in the newspaper, they'll have times. Like sunset right now is about 9.05. Well, it's not dark at 9.05. It gets dark at about 9.30 or 9.40. But for boating, when it's sunset, whether it's 9.05, 6 o'clock or whatever, you have to have your navigation lights on. If the navigation lights are always going to be green and red on the front because green is always the right side, red's always the left side, and then that's called a stern light, which is the white light, and it's got to be visible from 360 degrees, meaning that you can see it from any direction. And like on a bigger boat like this, you see he's got the stern light up here and also on the back, so it's visible from any direction. The navigation lights not only let people know that you're out there on the water, but they also help you in navigating. And I'm, didn't, I'm not going to go into navigating like what's the right way, who's got the right of way and who doesn't have the right of way uh, today because it gets kind of confusing. But you just, it's common sense. I mean, if you're out there on the water and the boat's coming at you, you need to do what you need to to avoid it and them as well. But at nighttime, you have to have your lights up so they know you're there. And by law, you have to have those three lines. So that's another legal requirement. <clears throat> jet skis. Kids, grandkids, uh, younger people love jet skis. There's a few things that the laws for jet skis are different than they are for boats. With jet skis, by law, you have to have your life jacket on. And when I say life jacket on, that doesn't mean just draped over you it's got to be buckled and zipped to be qualified as on you have to wear that the entire time you're jet skiing another difference in legal requirements is if you're on a jet ski is that you have to have your kill switch attached and a kill switch or a safety lanyard basically means if you get thrown off of the jet ski it's going to shut your jet ski off the only way that you don't have to have that is if your jet ski has the capability of of self-circling where you can get back on it. But most of them, you have to have a kill switch on uh, to stop it. And boats have that too. Boats have a kill switch too, which you need to wear it if you're driving because if you get thrown out of the boat, the boat usually ends up circling to the right. And we call it the death circle because it just, it'll end up catching you. And if your boat for some reason doesn't circle, well, guess what? If you're not in it and it's still going, it's going to keep going until it hits something. So if you got your kill switch on and get tossed out, it'll shut it off. But by law on a jet ski, you have to have it on. Whereas a boat, it's not a legal requirement. It ought to be, but it's not. And with a jet ski too, and I think I've got a picture in here later, so I'll talk about it twice probably. But if you're wanting to ride three people, you need to make sure that your jet ski is rated with three people. Um, it's just kind of like your capacity plate on a boat. It tells you how many people is allowed to be on there. So you need to be aware of that. And this is 
So they're towing this person, this person, they're pulling a skier. Well, the skier's not going to be on the skis the whole time. He's eventually going to get back on the jet ski and get out of the water. So knowing that, that jet ski needs to be registered or capable of holding three people. If that's a two-person jet ski and you put him on there, you're in violation. So always for safety purposes, make sure that you have, it's rated for how many people's out there. And you see what this lady's doing? She's actually what's called an observer. If you're pulling somebody on a tube, a ski, or um, another device, you have to have an observer on board the boat to do nothing else but watch this person uh, to make sure that they're okay. And when they fall off, you can tell the driver. Now, if you notice, this jet ski's, ski's got mirrors. And a lot of boats will have a mirror. I mean, I'll say this, you can do it. A boat operator, if he has mirrors capable of seeing 160 degrees, can pull a tuber or a skier without an observer with the mirrors. But if you've ever driven a boat, there's a lot going on. And it's just, to me, it is not safe to try to look in the mirror and drive and not hit something take care of them. So I always tell people, have an observer in the boat with you to watch the person being towed. And an observer has to be a minimum age of 12 to qualify as an observer. But uh, a lot of people will have somebody observe and the observer will start telling them about other boats and other things. Well, tell them not to worry about that. Their only job is to make sure that the person being towed is safe. So. Now, I teach the boating education and you get your boating education certificate. And you can see here from the ages of 12 to 17, if you wanted to operate a vessel, which can be a boat, when I say vessel, it's a boat, jet ski, about anything that will float on the water. If they want to operate something over 10 horsepower from that age by themselves, they have to have their boating education certificate. Now they can do it with another adult that is of legal age or somebody else that already has their boating education certificate. Uh, they can do it without it. But the easiest way to do it is if you notice on my slides, down here's our website, this fw.ky.gov. You can go on there and go under boating education and we've got several different ways that you can get your boating education card. Uh, you can do it online where there's services, there's third parties that we have that you pay and do it. I teach it online, uh, virtually by Zoom, like we're doing today. And we're getting ready to have another class online that's also free. So there's, we got several different avenues for people from 12 to 17 years old to take the class and get certified. And I always say it's a great class for adults. You'll learn as much as the kids learn. A uh, good thing for the adults is, is that your insurance company will give you a break most of the time on your insurance if there is ever such a thing as that if you have your boat education card but kids and grandkids i mean jet skis is the big thing for them and it's always that age group 12 to 17 so it's important to get them into the class uh, to get their certification it is for life and the boating education certificate is not only good for kentucky it's good for all 50 states because like i said it's approved by the national organization across the boards so you can take it. I've had people from Ohio and different places take it. So um, don't let that stop you from taking it if you're from out of state. Another law is on federally controlled waters. And when we say federally controlled waters, that mostly means like Corps of Engineers, US Corps of Engineers. They're, they have a different stipulation than us. They require you to have a visual distress signal on board your vessel if you're on their waterways. And that can be smoke, uh, flares, lights, any of that stuff. But that is something that is different than state law. Uh, and it's only on federally controlled waterways. Another law that a lot of people don't know about is when do you actually have to report a boat accident? And you actually have to report that to us at Fish and Wildlife. I get a lot of questions sometimes like, well, how are we going to know what the phone number is for Fish and Wildlife? The easiest way I can tell you is, is everybody knows 911. 
If you call 911 and say, I've been in a boat accident or I'm reporting a boat accident, they will get you in touch with us. Uh, they dispatch to us just like they do state police and other law enforcement agencies. So you can just dial 911 and get a hold of us. But there's three things that is by law that you have to report to us. The first one is if there is a death or a disappearance of someone on a boat. Let's say somebody gets thrown off the boat and they disappear, but you don't know if they have drowned or not. Well, that's reportable. A death or that or a missing person must be reported to us. The next one is an injury requiring more than medical attention, basically meaning not a Band-Aid, you have to go to the hospital, or for a person who's been knocked out for 24 hours or more, which you're probably going to go to the hospital, have them taken to the hospital for that. That's number two that has to be reported to us. And the third one is for property damage of $500 or more. I don't know if you ever fool the boat much, but if you nick a boat, it takes literally nothing for $500 worth of damage. Uh, so if you hit another boat or another jet ski or something to that end, and there's some damage, more than likely you're gonna have to report that as a boat accident. Now you can go online to our website again at fw.ky.gov and there's a place for boat accident report. Or if you go to the store, wherever we sell hunting and fishing licenses, we will have a boating guide. And in the back of that boating guide will be a boat accident report. But just keep in the back of your mind, you know, if it's serious, which is death, disappearance, or hospital visit, you need to report it. And basically, if there's proper damage of $500 or more, and 911 will get you through to us. Uh, I've had people ask me, do I need to report a boat accident if I'm standing on the shore and I see something? The answer to that is by law, no, but would it be a good idea to be a good witness and get a hold of us and say, hey, this is what I saw? Because we're going to want to get as much information as we can. So I say, you don't have to report it. You won't get in trouble if you don't, but as a good citizen, it's a good thing to do for us. It helps us out. All right, and as most of y'all may not be on waterways, if you're on the river, you're gonna see some stuff like this. But these are commercial vessels, they're barges, and a barge can be a quarter mile in length. Uh, if you've ever seen one up close and personal, it's, they're pretty impressive. Um, by law, you've gotta stay 50 foot off this. This guy down here and the, these two guys in this boat down here, they are within 50 feet, but I tell people, trust me, if you get to within 50 foot of this, you're gonna move anyway because you're gonna feel like you're right on top of it. Now for a Coast Guard or a Navy ship, at 500 yards, you have to start getting out of the way and at 100 yards, they're gonna come talk to you. You're not allowed to be within 100 yards of a Navy vessel. But I just throw this in there which like I said, it's common sense. I mean, if you run up on a barge, you're gonna know that, hey, I don't need to be around that. But by law, it's 50 feet. You have a 50 foot zone, you have to stay off of it. And 500 yards is what I leave it at for uh, Navy vessels and Coast Guard cutters. Now, this is very important. Do you need to do this exactly? No, but it's called a float plan. It's basically who, what, where, when but it's, it's great, it's, it just needs to be done. Most of y'all probably do it without thinking. You just probably tell whoever's at the house saying, hey, I'm going down to the lake with so-and-so. But get in the habit of telling somebody where you're going, who you're with, what times you think you're gonna be gone. You know, say, hey, we're gonna go out about noon, we'll be back home at about eight tonight. So that way they know when to get concerned and not concerned. Um, you need to tell them what ramp you're going to. Uh, give a vehicle and a boat description because when somebody calls us and says, hey, so-and-so has never come back from the river, I need you to go find them. Well, the first thing I'm going to want to know is, is, well, hey, what vehicle are they driving? What kind of boat do they have? And where did they put in at? So that way I can go to the boat ramp and if I see a black Dodge pickup, I'll say, oh, there's the truck so I can get started. Uh, and the times you'll be gone is important because that lets you know that, hey, they're not back at nine o'clock, but they said they were going to be out till eight. So you probably wouldn't be as concerned. But by 11 o'clock, you're going to be concerned. But you can look at this float plan 
I mean, it's got all kinds of stuff, engine type, survival equipment. Some of them will have hospital addresses and all this stuff. Telephone numbers are good and not good just for the person that owns the boat. It's good for everybody in the boat because somebody may leave their phone or somebody may have some different type of cell phone service. Uh, like back home is a great example. AT&T doesn't work at all, but bluegrass cellular is what you use. So I may come home to visit, go down to Car Fork Lake, and my phone's useless, but so-and-so's phone will be good. So give everybody a cell phone number to somebody so that we can try to get a hold of them. And then most typically, if you're on a lake or a body of water, sometimes there's not great cell phone signal, but at least we've got it and we've got somewhere to start. So always get in the practice of telling somebody who, what, where, and when and get ready to go out boating so that we know you're safe and we now know where to come look for you if not. Hmm. Now, may see these, may not. It's kind of like with barges. Uh, just depends on what body of water you're on. But there's two kind of buoy systems on waterways. The first one is called lateral markers, and they're always going to be red or green. This is a lateral marker, too. It looks a little different. But they're always red and green because they basically describe to you which way you're going, up river, down river, up the lake, down the lake. Common rule of thumb is, is if you see the red marker on the right side of your boat, it's called red right return. And that basically means you're going up river. Uh, and there is even on lakes, up the lake and down the lake. But if you see red on your right, you know that you're going upstream. And another thing these two markers do is even though this is a little narrow space right here, all the water in between these two markers is considered safe. Uh, it's designed that way for all kinds of boats so that you don't have to worry about running over rocks or running aground. Now the area out to the sides may not be as safe, but you know that if you're in between the two, you're good to go. You're in the channel as it's called. So, you know, just keep that in your mind. Those two, if you see the green and the red, you know if you're in the middle of those, you're in the safe zone. The other one is regulatory buoys, and you'll see a bunch of those. Uh, they'll have them as swim areas, which means don't keep out, you can't go in there. Hazard ones, where there's rocks, shallow water, dangerous things, uh, pump out stations, they'll have regulatory buoys. They're just basically information for you to know what, what you're supposed to be doing. And if you see one that's got the diamond with a cross, that means you're not allowed to go in there, period. And the one with the open diamond just usually means, hey, watch what you're doing. Here's a common one that a lot of people don't know. Your anchor rope, this is your anchor rope. If you're wanting to anchor, your anchor needs to be seven to 10 times the depth of the water. So if you're in 10 foot of water, you need 70 foot of rope minimum. And that's so you get a good hold point so that your boat won't drift on you. So a lot of people don't do that. They'll have a little rope and they'll drop it straight down. And before you know it, your boat's all over the place. That's because it's not long enough. However deep the water is, seven to 10 times the length of rope. So having 200 foot of rope attached to your anchor is not crazy. That's probably just good to have that much. Uh, the other thing is, is you don't ever want to anchor off to the back of the boat. The back of the boat's called the stern. The front's called the bow. You don't want to ever anchor to the stern because that part of the boat is not designed to take waves. So if you start taking waves and you're anchored down, water's gonna start coming into the boat. So only anchor off the bow. The bow is designed to take waves. And it's the safest, uh, safest spot to anchor to. But know that you can't have enough length of rope uh, for your anchor line. And you know, most lakes and rivers are 30 to 40 feet deep. Well, if you're doing seven to 10 times that, you're looking at 300 foot of rope. So don't think it's crazy have all this rope attached to your anchor because that is going to be the safest thing for you. And if you've ever done it and had a short anchor rope, you know what I'm talking about. Your boat's drifted and you'll look up and you're like, man, we're not even where we anchored at. That's just some good knowledge right there. There's, there's no legal requirements for that. That's just good, safe practice. Next thing, and if y'all want to look at the left side first, Left side is easier to make sense of. 
These are called navigational charts. Um, it's like a map. It's like your AAA map when you used to take a trip on the road. But this is for the water. And a navigational chart shows you what we just talked about. It shows you the lateral markers. And as you can see, it shows you what's safe and what's not. And then it shows you the regulatory buoys where you can and can't be. And shows you landmarks and some other things. This is what it actually looks like. That looks confusing. But if you understand that red and green are lateral markers and these are regulatory buoys, you can kind of start deciphering some of this stuff when you look at it. You can get a navigational chart for most all bodies of water in the United States. Used to, you could buy a copy. It was a hard copy, but they actually quit doing them. Now you have to go online and either look at it online or download it. But you can punch in Tennessee River, Kentucky River, Car Fork Lake, any of these, and they'll have a navigational chart of them. But I just wanted to show you that so that you know that, hey, you could study somewhere. Like if you were going to go to North Carolina and fish uh, Gunnersville, or Alabama and fish Gunnersville, I'm sorry, you could study it a little bit before you even got down there. Uh, and being prepared, and I, it's educating yourself, you never, go, you never go wrong by doing that. All boats since 1972 are just like a car. They have a HIN number. It's called a hull identification number. And since 72, they've been putting, manufacturers have been putting them on the boats. You'll see either a plate stamped on there or you'll see them like etched into fiberglass or scratched in. But they basically give information. This is good for you to keep and write down because if your boat gets sunk, lost, stolen, then I can look at this whole identification number and run it and find out who owns it. So that's something for you to kind of keep uh, in your records. So if something happens, your boat gets gone, you can say, look, here's my whole identification number. And especially if it's scratched, if it's etched in, you know, it's, it's not, you can't just easily remove that. But all boats in 72 have this. It's called a HIN number, same as a VIN, just for boats. These, Maybe like the barge or the Coast Guard ship. These are diver down flags. Uh, even in my 21 years of working, I think I've only seen a diver down maybe three times. But if you see these flags in the water, basically that means somebody's diving and you must by law stay 100 foot off these flags and 360 degrees of it, be 100 feet off of it uh, because somebody's under the water and they may pop up within that 100 feet and you sure for sure don't want to hit them. Um, what is the first thing you should do if you encounter a boat accident? Now this is not if you're involved in one, this is if you happen to run up on one and you need to provide assistance. But when I say provide assistance, you'll see there's two criteria in here that is the reason that you don't. If it's going to be a danger to your life or somebody on your boat, or if it's going to be a danger to your vessel or your boat, you don't need to provide assistance because if your boat gets destroyed or you get hurt, you're not helping anybody. So if those two factors are not an issue, you want to go provide assistance to somebody. But just keep that aware. If it's a danger to you or others or to your boat, it's a no-go. You don't do it. This picture right here is to show you about carbon monoxide. I mean, just like a car has got a muffler and produces gas, so does a boat. If you're burning gas with a motor, you're producing carbon monoxide. A lot of people like to swim at the back of a boat. Um, a lot of them have swim platforms. Carbon monoxide gets trapped on that swim platform. And believe it or not, we have several drownings a year from carbon monoxide poisoning because it just basically puts you to sleep. But you need to be aware of that. First of all, it makes common sense for safety. The boat doesn't need to be running if y'all are swimming back there. Some of your bigger giner boats will be running because it runs generators and other things. But just be aware if the boat's running, this is a danger zone. And if it's a little small boat, hey, people need to, to uh, turn the boat off. And this, is, this brings up a point to me too. If you've got somebody in the water, you're the boat operator, what side of the boat would you want to pull up on to get somebody out of the water? 
you think you'd want to pull up on the passenger side or the side where you're driving. It's pretty common sense if you think about it because boat sets up a little bit out of the water. If you get up close to somebody on the passenger side, guess what? You're not going to be able to see them anymore. So we always want to pull up when we get somebody out of the water on the driver's side. And the very first thing we want to do when we get there is turn the motor off because we don't want anybody to have a chance of getting hurt with a prop. So always pull up on the driver's side and then always turn your motor off. Now, this is, this is for if somebody's in distress and it's a little saying, it's called reach throw, row, go. And you follow it in sequence. The very first thing you want to do is reach for somebody, just like this gentleman is right here. There's one thing you want to be aware of when you reach for somebody. If somebody is actually in distress in the water, the last place they want to be is the water. So the minute they latch on to whatever you give them, they are going to yank on that whether it's a boat oar, your arm, or your leg. So you need to be aware of that and be stable, low center of gravity, have a hold of something firm. Trust me, if you offer somebody in distress your hand, you don't have to worry about pulling them out of the water because they are gonna climb you like a tree to get out of the water. Now, what do you think happens if you don't have a good center of gravity and you're just not holding on very good? The very next thing that's gonna happen is, is you're going in the water with this person. Trust me when I tell you this, if that person is 300 pounds, 10 pounds, or 100 pounds, when you get in the water with them, they're going to be out of the water. And the only place that means is, is they're going to put their entire body on top of your head. And that will happen, I promise you. And then where are you going to be? you're gonna be under the water. So when you reach to somebody, you make sure that you've got a good grip on something and you are not gonna be leaving the boat or the dock or wherever you are that you're reaching to them from, that you're not going in the water. The next part is throw. That's what these gentlemen are doing. If you can't reach somebody quick and in a hurry, the very first, next thing you need to do is throw them something that floats. A life jacket is great. That top four throw cushion that we talked about the style of life jacket is great. What can we have attached to our throw cushion that would be beneficial? We could have some rope attached to it because then you throw them the throw cushion and you can pull them over to you at the boat. But not only is throwing them something that floats gonna be good for them in distress, but the other thing is it's a mental game. If somebody's in distress and panicking, when they get a hold of something that floats, it's gonna calm them down. And you have to be a thinking person to survive a bad situation. Uh, a gas can half full of gas, it floats. May not float great, but it floats. A cooler half full of food, it will float. You get them whatever you can that floats because you want to put their mind at ease. So you throw them something that floats and then you work your way over to them. And that's what row is. Row means you're going to row over to them after you throw them something that floats you're going to take the boat or whatever you're on over to them to pick them up. Now, the last thing, and I will caution you that this is the most dangerous thing that you could ever do is get in the water to try to go get somebody. Like I said, we have extensive training in swimming and saving people and all this stuff, but we've lost officers and other states have lost officers to trying to save drowned victims. Um, that person that's in the water in distress does not look at you as mom, dad, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, cousin. The only thing that's on their mind is as I'm coming out of this water. I lost a good friend from high school. Uh, he drowned and his girlfriend barely made it. She got away from him. She had to get away from him because he was, he was trying to get out and trying to pull her in and down with him. But if you have to go, there's two things you need to keep in mind. You need to know your capabilities. You for sure better have your life jacket on. And know that if somebody gets a hold of you and they're trying to get on top of your head, what is the first thing you can do that is guaranteed that they're not gonna hang on to you anymore? They won't out of the water. 
So if you can think what you've got to think, dive under the water. If you dive under the water, they're going to let go of you because you're going somewhere that they don't want to be. That is one thing. Another thing is to get somebody to let go of you is you can punch them in the face, um, preferably the nose, because that's going to make them for a split second stop their thought process. Um, so that's two ways you can disengage with somebody if they're getting ready to pull you down. But I don't even like to talk about go, but if it's a family member, it's hard. You're just going to do things. But the main thing is, is that you keep in your mind what your capabilities are and know that when they get a hold of you, what they're going to do, know how to get away from them so that you're not a victim also. And I'm, there's another part in here where I'm going to talk some more about it. But it's reach, throw, row, go. To me, the most important thing is throwing something that floats because guess what? Even if you can reach to them, throw them a life jacket. It should be readily accessible to you. If it is, toss it to them. That's only going to help things out. So throw to me is the most important out of those four. Now, cold water, hypothermia. Hypothermia is where your body loses more heat than it produces. Basically, you start chilling and shivering. Um, water temperature can be just 70 degrees, and hypothermia will start setting in. So it doesn't take the water to be really cold. But if you're out in the fall or early spring, is something to be aware of. Uh, say your boat capsizes, you get thrown in the water or whatever, you can do HELP, which is basically stands for heat escape resting position. And all that is, is just going into the fetal position. When you pull your knees up to your chest and wrap your arms around them, it protects your body and makes it save its heat. Now, if there's several of you in the water, huddle up uh, to do that. This is the point, too, where I always want to say if a boat capsizes, more than likely, very often, a part of it's going to be floating above the water. You want to get out of the water. Even though you may think it's colder outside with the air, you are better off out of the water than being in cold water. So you need to try to get on top of your capsized boat. Even in boat emergencies in normal conditions, if you boat flips over you stay with the boat if the bank's 20 feet away you unless there is no other way you're getting out of there you are better off to get on top of your boat and wait till somebody comes by because they're going to see you i uh, can't tell you how many drowning reports we've done that are five to six feet from the bank um, you know people think well that's not as far as it looks i can swim that it's hard to judge distance when you're on the water so if it's feasible, stay with the boat. Somebody's going to come by and see you and take care of you. Now, if you're out there by yourself and nobody else is on the lake or you know nobody's going to be, well, you're probably going to have to do what you got to do. But for safety purposes, the safest thing is to stay with your boat instead of trying to swim to shore. And, of course, have your life jacket on. So that pretty much ends up my PowerPoint um, presentation, some boat and water safety things. I just touched the iceberg with that stuff and I hope I didn't talk too fast to cause problems. But now it'll make a little more sense to you when I say we want you to boat safe on the water. The S is for safety and even though we're out there recreating, we're having fun, always, always keep safety in the back of your mind. The A is going to be for awareness. Uh, whether you're the driver, you're the passenger in the boat, you can always have fun, but you can always just kind of pay attention to what's going on around you. Because especially like this holiday weekend that's coming up July 4th, there'll be so many people on the water. You want to be aware of what's going on around you to keep you and your passengers safe. F is for functional. We talked about a lot of things that can be functional. Your fire extinguisher needs to be functional. Your life jacket needs to be functional. Uh, we didn't talk about bilge pumps, but most boats are equipped with a bilge pump that if the boat's taking on water, it pumps it out. Well, guess what? If your bilge pump isn't working, ah, it's not going to do you any good. So you want to make sure your navigation lines, you want to make sure all your safety equipment is functional. And that means you take a check. You don't do it once a year, but <coughs> quite often. 
<clears throat> Fourth thing is educated. There is a wide range of educated. You can never educate yourself enough. Just with the little stuff I've talked to you all today, that's education. YouTube stuff's education. If you take the boating education course, that's educate yourself. Always, always educate yourself. The more educated you are about something, the safer you're gonna be. So when we say boat safe, that actually has a pretty strong and profound meaning. Before I hit stop share on the screen, feel free to write my name and phone number down. And this is my personal phone number. You can get a hold of me day or night with it and my email address. No question is a bad question. And if I can help you out, I'm gonna help you out. So take a second and write that down and I'll shut it down in a second, but I'll give you a moment to get that wrote down. And if I don't know the answer to something, I will get you in touch with somebody that does. That's a promise. And I'm gonna stop it now, but if y'all still need to get it down, I'll give it to you when we get done. <coughs> was that too much too fast? Marcus, that was great information. That that great information. Uh, uh, in my opinion, you could have talked on life jackets for 45 minutes. Uh, I can I cannot iterate how important life jacket is. It is your seatbelt in a boat. I, I agree with that. Uh, I had a uh, I was part of an incident. I guess you could say. Uh, luckily, uh, the person uh, uh, did not drown. Uh, the person was pulled from the water, but immediately after that. Uh, everybody in the boat had a life jacket on. Yeah, and, I, and I'll ask you this. How how big of a pucker factor did you have and how much of a lasting impression did that put in your mind for the rest of your life on boating? I'll tell you what, every time I get, get on one or near one, I have a life jacket on. Uh, uh, I'm pushing big time. I'm trying to get people, just like I was talking about, seatbelt in a car, that boat starts moving, you have a life jacket on. I'm, I'm trying to preach that as much as I can. Exactly. I have a top three and I also have a top five. And uh, I, I use the top five basically for fishing because uh, yeah. it's non-bulky. And, um, you know, hey, it's well worth uh, it's well worth the money you spend. Even the top five. I mean, it's well worth the, uh, uh, the hundred bucks that you would spend on one uh, or whatever they yeah. are. So, uh, and you know, and you need to be aware. It's yeah. the seatbelt. Yeah. And you need to be aware too, if you do have a top five vest, they also have an expiration date. You got to replace your CO2 cartridges and stuff in that. So check that from time to time uh, to make sure it's up to snuff. Definitely. But great information. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that you didn't have your, in your presentation was make sure the plug's in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't been boating and left the plug out, you haven't been boating. Uh, been, been part of that. Been part of that myself. <laughs> we do that work wise. We'll go out and work, and we'll be like, "Man, we're taking on water," and then we'll look at each other like, "Did you put the plug in?" And we're like, "I don't know. Did you put it in?" So. <laughs> oh shoot! But does anybody have any? What is it? Great information, and I was going to say, anybody have any questions? Yes, does anybody got any questions? There is not a bad question. I think you may have answered all their questions. Elizabeth, Elizabeth may have decided that it was just too much and, and just focused on her knitting. No, no. Uh -uh. So I'm here. I've been listening. <laughs> I lost the video for some reason. Oh, really? Like, like for the whole most of the PowerPoint? No, my my videos. Oh, oh okay. yours is good. Okay. No. Did everybody get my actually, phone up? Actually, Elizabeth, I turned your uh, video off to save some bandwidth. Oh, no big deal. Did everybody get my number down and wants my number and my email address? Yes, I got it. Okay, good. You call me for anything. I mean that wholeheartedly. Marcus, thanks so much uh, for for coming and joining us tonight. We really, really appreciate it, uh, and uh, you gave some really great timely information. We call it timely because uh, the day that I, I reached out to you by email, uh, 
Phil, Shad, and I had sat down, and one of the things that we saw was the 4th of July coming up, and we definitely wanted to have this prior to the 4th. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you too, Jeremy, and even you, Philip, if, when things get by, I have no issues with coming up and doing something in person. So you all use me however you all think you can, I can benefit you. That would be wonderful, and that may be something that uh, we look in we look into whether uh, the three of us get together and have some sort of a family safety event or something like that. Uh, like I said, when things get back to normal, uh, we would definitely call on you. Yeah, well, we're doing I'm doing stuff with canoes, kayaks, and paddle boards because that's the three hottest things going right now. Yes, sir. Um, so I've been taking some extra training to help do some stuff with that. I've got the canoe stuff. We're getting ready to go do some kayak stuff, but maybe we can do some of that in the future. That that's definitely big right now. Uh, those 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 are definitely big uh, big subjects right now. So that that that's great. That would be great. Okay. What did somebody send in a chat? Okay. Yeah, Dustin just said uh, he said I really enjoyed this. It's been extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna jump off, but now if y'all need something or think of something after this, feel free to get up with me. Marcus, thank you so much. All right. I'll talk to you on a little bit. Thank, thank you. you. Take hey, care. Happy, happy Fourth of July. Hey, you too. Y'all be safe out there. You too. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, good to uh, see everybody this evening. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday next Tuesday and Thursday, and uh, everybody have a great Independence Day. Uh, think about what it, what, it's, uh, what it means. Dustin, I noticed he's got an American flag right there on his hat. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> it, 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 uh, this is a great holiday. Everybody be safe, uh, uh, whether you're, you're out there on the boat. Uh, uh, it's going to be sunny. Don't get sunburned. Uh, uh, Fireworks, that sort of thing. Uh, just take care, and uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, Tuesday. Bill, you got anything to add? I don't. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Everybody, have a great Independence Day, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see you all on Tuesday. You too, Jeremy. See you, everyone.